Imagine a rich, entitled young man storms into your home and claims that he is taking your wife away for a few months. He's not simply asking, he's threatening. At first, I wanted to knock him out cold, delivering his smug sneer a few well-deserved fists. But then I reconsidered and took a different strategy. It was simply another crazy Thursday afternoon. I was packing my tools into my pickup truck after a difficult job. The client I was dealing with couldn't decide on a staircase design and changed it every few days. That morning, they presented me with a fresh request that included demolishing the majority of what I had already completed. I had to start from scratch, working with architects and engineers to accommodate the unexpected new demands. I ended up with an unexpected day off the following day. My name is Jackson Henderson, and I own a tiny yet successful woodworking business that specializes in high-end stairs. We serve wealthy households, luxury hotels, restaurants, and business headquarters. Our clientele are willing to spend upwards of $30,000 for a custom staircase. My wife, Caroline Adams, is 29 years old, and I am 33. She is a bright lawyer who practices commercial and intellectual property law at Nelson, Baker, and Bennett. We've chosen to postpone having children for the time being because Caroline's work is rapidly progressing. I pulled into my driveway around 5.10 p.m. I observed anything peculiar. Caroline's automobile was already present. She usually works late on Thursdays to shorten her Friday. As I approached the house, I noticed another anomaly. The water pressure was poor. Caroline frequently takes a shower in the morning or just before bed. So why the shower right now? I changed into more comfortable clothes and went upstairs to find out why Caroline was home so early. Sure enough, she had just gotten out of the shower. She was changing into black fishnet stockings, and a sleek new black dress was put out on the bed, ready to wear. Hello, honey. Why are you home so early? Am I forgetting anything? Do we have plans for tonight? I bombarded her with questions, my tone alternately confused and concerned. She returned my stare with an unusual and unnerving expression, a tremble of apprehension lurking just beneath the surface. She exhaled a long sigh and steadied herself before speaking. No, Jackson, you have not forgotten anything. I'm going out tonight, but you aren't. I will be absent till Sunday afternoon, spending the weekend with somebody else. My voice caught in my throat. Words fail me temporarily. What exactly are you talking about? Is this some kind of business trip? I clung to any rational explanation, wanting to comprehend. No, Jackson, this is not about business. Noah has a hotel suite reserved. I will be returning next week. But this weekend, I'm with him, Caroline declared, her voice deceptively calm, as if every word had been carefully chosen. You cannot be serious. I'm not okay with my wife spending the weekend with another man. What type of game is this? Anger began to stew within me, mixed with a strong sense of betrayal. You might as well get accustomed to it, Jackson, because it is not what anyone wants. And I'd think twice before crossing him, she said. Her chuckle was piercing and cold, cutting through the tense atmosphere between us. So you are in on this. You expect me to simply nod and bottle up my emotions while you walk out the door. Then you'll simply return and act the dutiful wife, I retorted, my cynicism strong and stinging. I did not say it was only this weekend. Noah wants this now and again, so certainly you will go along with it and remain silent. Believe me, it is easier that way. She spoke bluntly, leaving no room for dispute or protest. We'll see about it. I'm not going to stand by and let that jerk govern our life. If you believe you can treat me like a chess piece and I will not fight back, you are mistaken, I warned. As Caroline continued to prepare for her evening, I maintained a stern and challenging tone. I felt a hollow hole emerge in my gut. I walked downstairs, grabbed a beer from the fridge, and noticed a gorgeous Mercedes pull up. Noah stepped outside. His confidence bordered on arrogance when he reached our front door and rang the doorbell. Jackson. That's Noah. Can you get the door? Caroline's voice came down from upstairs, calm but forceful. I entered the code into the rear door alarm panel, ensuring it was activated. Then I got my cell phone ready to record video. I slid it into my t-shirt pocket, angled perfectly to capture everything. I took a big breath and sat down in the living room, ready myself for the impending confrontation. I'd known Noah since Caroline joined the legal company about four years ago. I initially met him at the corporate holiday party. Noah, a man in his late thirties, always carried himself with an unmistakable air of arrogance, 
charming co-workers while dismissing and outright unpleasant to others, particularly their spouses. I'd never liked him. Caroline ran downstairs, her agitation evident, and slammed the door wide. I apologize for the wait, Noah. My husband seemed to have forgotten his manners. She spoke softly, more humble than normal, as she leaned in close to Noah. She muttered something into his ear, a quiet hiss lost in the space between us. Noah's entry into the living room was bold and unrepentant. Hey, friend, I hear you're not happy that Caroline is joining me for the weekend, he called out, his voice full of scorn. Get out of my house or I'll contact the cops, I snapped, my hands bawling into fists and my entire body clenched with rage. He burst out laughing, the sound harsh and taunting. Caroline stood behind him, smirking, complicit in his hubris. So what do you suppose the cops will do? Nothing. They will not lift a finger. Do you know why? When he saw my cell phone, his expression turned to one of alarm. He lunged at it, but it was tightly shut. In a rage, he grabbed it and flung it to the floor, shattering with a loud bang. You think you have control here? Noah taunted, edging closer, his gaze narrowed with menace. Pay close attention. Your wife is spending the weekend with me, whether you like it or not. What is your opinion? They signify nothing. Despite my seething rage, I keep still and my voice is steady. Threats do not intimidate me, Noah. But they give me a solid notion of who you are, he sneered. Oh, I am just getting started. If you try to tamper with us, if you say anything about this to anyone, you'll regret it more than you can imagine. And what does that mean, Noah? Caroline interjected, her tone abruptly sharp and revealing a glimmer of her typical fury. What exactly are your plans? Noah looked at her, irritation flashing across his face. Stay out of this, Caroline. This is between myself and him. He ignored her and returned his attention to me. Keep quiet and out of the way. If I find out you've disturbed Caroline, discussed divorce, or attempted to contact my wife, things are going to become ugly. I lifted an eyebrow faking confusion. I've never been involved in money laundering or anything illegal, I responded gently, attempting to deflect his rage. Noah laughed, chilly and hollow. Who mentioned anything about money laundering? But now that you mention it, installing something on your PC would be simple. I have something that could wreck you. But having illicit materials is a felony, Noah. If you threaten to upload it to my computer, doesn't it imply you're already involved? I retorted, hoping to catch him off guard. He dismissed my question. The difference between us is basic. I have connections that make the seemingly impossible a reality. He bragged about his apparent power. Caroline watched the discussion, her face tightening. This is not what we agreed to, Noah. Noah looked to her, softening but still warning her. Caroline, do you remember that we're in this together? Simply stick to the strategy. As the tension rose, the room felt smaller charged with the electricity of approaching conflict as he listed out his demands, including a nasty warning about not seeking vengeance and a crude remark about my connection with Caroline. My thoughts spun with the sheer boldness of it all. I was overwhelmed with wrath and disbelief. Despite the chaos, I felt a quiet sense of thankfulness for the robust security measures I had put in place. Following a previous break-in, our entire home was outfitted with video cameras and an alarm system. Caroline is unaware of the details. Everything that was going on right now, including this tense argument, was being recorded on video, as was the phone that he destroyed. It was only a deception. He had no idea how prepared I actually was. Caroline and her partner stepped out of the door. The reality of what had just occurred became clear. I felt a mix of shock and indignation, as well as a strange sense of relaxation. I had acquired strong evidence of his threats and manipulation, which may be critical if the divorce proceeded. The cell phone he shattered on the ground was actually my work phone. After years of dealing with demanding clients, I learned the hard way that giving them my personal phone number resulted in constant calls. Having a second work phone allowed me to turn it off after hours and deal with any messages in the morning. Fortunately, I still had my personal phone available. I quickly called Lucas, my company lawyer and close buddy. Lucas married my older sister Emma ten years ago. They lived a happy life together until she died in a sad accident on a lakeside trip. Despite the enormous tragedy, Lucas remained emotionally linked to our family, gaining us unwavering love and respect when Emma died. He ultimately found happiness with Charlotte, and the two married. Lucas and Charlotte were at my wedding with Caroline, 
and they are still as close to me as family, although facing a significant threat. I really needed Lucas's guidance. I told him about Noah's ominous threats and the troubling situation with Caroline. Lucas's response was fast and reassuring. He told me to stay put, avoid making contact with anyone, and switch off all communication devices. He and Charlotte would arrive within an hour with dinner. Even hearing his steady, encouraging voice provided me a sense of security in the middle of chaos. Lucas was quick to offer his support when I told him about the alarming threats from someone named Nelson and the upsetting occurrences during my wife's covert escape. He told me to stay indoors, avoid contacting anybody else, and turn off all of my gadgets. He told me that he and Charlotte would arrive within an hour and bring dinner with them. His remarks provided me with a strong sense of security when I most needed it. As I sat there, I realized what had happened in the previous hours. Caroline had been captivated by Nelson's powerful presence and charisma. I never anticipated she would reject our affection for him. It was a terrible realization that our bond was not as strong as I had believed. Caroline and I first met at a mutual friend's birthday celebration five years ago. She was the sister of the birthday boy, an army officer stationed in Afghanistan. Despite not knowing many of the individuals there, we immediately clicked. Our spark rapidly developed into a whirlwind romance that led to marriage just a year later. Throughout our time together, I continued to work for Mr. Miller in his tiny but well-known woodworking shop. Jacob Miller was a talented craftsman who struggled with business. While still in college, he hired me as a part-time accountant to manage his books. Mr. Miller secured three large contracts after only a few months on the job. He was stretched thin, and these initiatives required more of him than he could provide. His clients insisted that he handle them personally, so he asked me to step in and help out on the field. Initially, my duty was simple. Run errands, gather supplies, and assist with heavy lifting. But it wasn't long before my talent for the job began to show. As I got the hang of it, I started doing easy things on my own and became a go-to for more difficult jobs. While I was still obtaining my accounting degree, my desire for hands-on experience led me to an apprenticeship. A few years later, I received my certification and became Mr. Miller's right-hand man. When he retired, my parents helped me financially, allowing me to purchase Mr. Miller's share. Over two years. The lawyers at NBD dismissed me as just another uneducated shop worker, but this didn't bother me. My business was thriving, taking on fewer but more profitable projects. I recently hired two assistants, and my income and business value were now higher than many of my wife's lawyer colleagues. Caroline, on the other hand, remained unaware of these accomplishments. My reflections were cut short when Charlotte and Lucas arrived with Chinese takeout and beers. Are you all right, Jackson? Charlotte asked, enveloping me in a comforting hug. Lucas responded with his own supportive embrace. I can't believe Caroline would do this. It's so out of character for her, he said, sounding just as shocked as I was. I agreed. Do not worry, buddy. We will figure it out. Let's eat, and then I'll listen to your recording. I told him how unwelcome Caroline and her guests had made me feel. After we finished dinner, I took out my laptop and opened the files that contained both video and audio recordings from the house. Fortunately, the image was crystal clear. I can't believe what I just heard, Lucas exclaimed, shaking his head. Isn't that guy a little overconfident? I commented casually. Lucas scoffed. He's not only arrogant, he's utterly foolish. What is his age, 39, perhaps 42? That means he's been practicing law for approximately 15 years. He's so caught up in himself that you didn't think twice about making him believe he wasn't being recorded after he smashed your phone, which was brilliant. He fell for it. Hook, line, sinker, we spilled everything we needed, but can I really use this? It was recorded without his knowledge. I inquired, worried about the legality. Absolutely. Jackson, this is your home. Are you allowed to record anything here? Lucas confirmed with confidence. So I am covered. I wanted to make sure you didn't have anything to worry about, he reassured me, his voice steady and comforting. Nope, that is not what I am saying. Lucas warned us to proceed with extreme caution. His face had a serious expression. I did some investigating on the way over here. He pointed to Hunter, who had driven and picked up the takeout. It turns out that Nelson is the son of the law firm's founder. I nodded, aware of this detail. 
but you might not be aware that his father, Colin Nelson, had quite the reputation. He wasn't much of a lawyer, but he had known most of the local judges since college. He could easily sway cases in his favor. Sadly, his son Noah is on the same path. That's what makes him dangerous, Lucas explained, his concern palpable. He has a network of friendly judges, so if he decides to sue, we will most likely lose, regardless of how wrong he is, I asked. The reality is beginning to dawn on me. Not necessarily. It will be challenging, but not impossible. I have some connections to Jackson. We need solid evidence to make a strong case against him. Lucas reassured me of his confidence, which lifted my spirits. But you just mentioned that judges tend to side with him. I pointed out, hoping to get clarification. Unless we take it to criminal court, Lucas said, a determined expression crossing his face. That is where Bill will be useful. We were interrupted by a knock at the front door. I turned to see a petite brunette waiting on the porch, which interrupted our intense planning session. Hello, Mr. Henderson. She gave me a polite nod. Hello, Grace. Come in. Lucas beckoned her in. Jackson, this is Grace Moore. She is a computer expert from the private investigative firm we collaborate with. I contacted her after our conversation. He introduced her to me and gave me a brief background. That evening, we told Grace about the whole mess, especially the part where Nelson threatened to plant incriminating evidence on my computer. Grace listened intently before laying out her plan. Okay, we have a few scenarios to prepare for. She began to take out a small gray box from her bag. First, they may attempt to physically access your computer, most likely during the day and possibly with your wife's help. They'd change the date settings and upload whatever they had, pretending it happened before Nelson's threat. Your camera system must capture all of this, so make sure it is recording before you leave tomorrow. Second, they could opt for remote access. I'm going to set up this device. It will connect to your modem. It will record any attempts to connect to your router and monitor what they try to upload or download, Grace persisted, her confidence reassuring. Before I install this, I recommend that you transfer any personal and sensitive data from your computer to a flash drive. Then wipe your computer clean. It's critical that no traces are left for them to exploit. Grace's expertise was evident and her plan was comprehensive. It was a relief to have someone with her skills by our side, Lucas interjected with urgency. Let's get moving, Jackson. Currently, the only solid evidence we have against him is that recording. If you go to court with just that, they might dismiss your case quickly. People do not always take blackmail seriously. Furthermore, the judges who favor him may simply let him off the hook. He leaned forward, his voice lowered. But if Nelson actually uploads illegal material to your computer and then informs the police that he discovered evidence of you having illegal content, everything changes. We'd have a clear record of everything that happened without your knowledge or consent, thanks to the recording in which Nelson basically tipped his hand. We have everything we need to build a solid case. Lucas paused, scanning my face to see if I understood in a criminal court. His benchmates will not want to touch this if it involves illegal content involving children. To protect themselves, they will avoid him. His strategy made sense, transforming a dire situation into a potential win with the right moves. We could turn Nelson's arrogance against him. I find that disturbing and twisted, I said, shaking my head in disbelief. Yes, but Nelson is just as twisted, if not more, Lucas replied grimly. Grace made a crucial point. One more thing, Jackson. Could you stay off your computer for the next few days? If Nelson goes ahead with his plan and then reports it, the police might check the computer records to see if anyone accessed the illegal files after they were uploaded. If you don't use it, it keeps the records clean, which is better for us. Also, make sure your cell phone doesn't connect to your home Wi-Fi to prevent them from using your phone to access your network. After our discussion... Grace set up a surveillance module and wiped all sensitive information from both my computer and phone. This module will send us copies of all access attempts. I'll contact Lucas and you once we get something. Best of luck, guys, she said as she packed up her tools and left. All right, let's shift focus to more immediate concerns. Lucas suggested bringing the conversation back to personal matters. Jackson, do you want to start the divorce process now or wait until Caroline is back to see if things can be resolved? No, I want a divorce as soon as possible. I can't stay married to someone who's so easily swayed by these so-called powerful men. I'm done, I declared firmly. Okay, 
I'll get in touch with Evelyn Thomas first thing tomorrow. She's the top family law expert at my office, known for being good, fair, and efficient. I'll have her reach out to you ASAP. You'll be in good hands, Lucas reassured me. We wrapped up our strategy session with me giving Lucas the access code to my recording system for real-time updates. Charlotte and Lucas left around 10 p.m., and not long after, I took a melatonin pill and was asleep within minutes, the weight of the day pressing down as darkness took over. At 8.30 the next morning, Evelyn Thomas was on the phone with me. She had just wrapped up a conversation with Lucas, who had filled her in on the details of my situation. I need to see you in my office by noon, she said firmly. During our meeting, Evelyn looked at me with genuine concern. I'm sorry you're going through this, she began. After I told her about Noah Nelson's dubious reputation, she quickly assured me. Since you bought the house before you met Caroline, and her name isn't on the deed, the property is solely yours. Plus, there are no children involved, so the divorce should be pretty straightforward. Worried about my business? I asked. What about my company? Could I be forced to sell it and split the proceeds? Lucas, who had accompanied me, quickly chimed in. Don't worry about that. The prenup states that your company is exclusively yours. Caroline can't claim any part of it. They might try to challenge it, but legally they don't stand on solid ground. I left Evelyn's office around 1.45 p.m., feeling more in control. Evelyn had taken command of the situation, reassuring me everything is handled. Caroline will be served the divorce papers at her office on Monday, after replacing my damaged cell phone. I spent the rest of the weekend working in the yard and catching up on my favorite TV shows, trying to regain some normalcy after the upheaval. Despite my deep-seated anger toward Caroline, the full reality of our crumbling marriage hadn't quite hit me yet. I knew a wave of grief was on its way, but for now, my emotions were just overwhelmingly raw. The thought of her returning home on Sunday loomed large, and I found myself wrestling with a tough decision. Should I move to the guest room, or should she? After some thought, I decided it was my house, and since she was the one who had walked away, she would be the one to move. I gathered all her belongings and placed them in the guest room. Then, to make a clear statement, I bought a new lock for my bedroom door, installed it, and kept the key securely in my pocket. That evening, as I heard her car pull up, I switched on the surveillance system to record from my window. I saw Caroline share a long French kiss with her boss before he drove off. Stepping inside, she found me in the living room, absorbed in a book. I didn't look up or acknowledge her presence choosing instead to remain focused on my reading, silently asserting the distance between us. How was your weekend? Caroline asked, her voice tinged with anxiety she couldn't quite mask. I noticed her composure slipping, but I chose not to look up from my book. Fine. Keep sulking then. Noah was right about you. You really don't get it, do you? He stated you wouldn't grasp my requirements or face up to your own shortcomings. She replied fiercely, her footsteps accelerating as she climbed the stairs as she disappeared upstairs. I secretly started counting under my breath. One, two, three. Sure enough, she stormed back down. Jackson? Henderson, what is this? Why is there a lock on our bedroom door? She demanded. Correction. I said quietly, it's my bedroom. Your belongings are in the guest room. You will stay there till you locate another place to reside. What the hell? Please wait until I tell Noah about this. This was not part of the plan. Plan? What's the plan? I have never agreed to any of your proposals. You can stay in the guest room or depart. Perhaps your friend can create room for you in his world. I responded, finally glancing up from my book, maintaining a steady look. Caroline went out without speaking and slammed the guest room door shut behind her. Frustrated, I followed and yelled through the door. And what exactly was I supposed to get out of all this? I merely got silence as an answer. Twenty minutes later, as I was cooling down downstairs, my phone rang with texts from an unknown number. I read, perplexed. What am I hearing, wussy? You won't allow Caroline enter her own room? I thought I explained myself clearly. Even someone like you should have it for tonight. I'll let your little tantrum go tomorrow. You should make Caroline's favorite dinner and apologize for your pranks. If you behave for the remainder of the week, I might let her be near to you next weekend. Step out of line and you'll see. I am not all talk. Do what you are told. There are no questions. Got it? His statements made my blood boil, but I knew I had to play it smart. 
this was precisely the type of proof that could assist me in court. I screenshot the messages, my thoughts racing on the next moves. I was not about to let this bully control my life. I gazed at the text messages, perplexed. This person was not only overbearing, but also insane. Foolish. I chose not to respond, instead taking a screenshot of the chat and forwarding it directly to Lucas. He responded back within minutes with a single phrase. Incredible. He said, This guy thinks he's the top dog, but he's just a top-tier fool. Keep the texts and do not engage. I followed Lucas's suggestion and disregarded Nelson's subsequent communications, which just acknowledged that I had seen his demands. He eventually gave up and quit texting. Caroline and I did not cross paths that night. I locked my bedroom door and kept the recording equipment going just in case. Before going to bed, I wrote a quick message to one of my assistants, informing him that I would be in late the next morning, after Caroline had left the house. I awoke early the next day. I poured myself some breakfast and started uploading the overnight recordings from my system. Caroline did not leave the guest room until the morning, according to the camera. She used the guest bathroom, showered, and then departed the house without eating. Interestingly, she hadn't messed with my computer, which I had half expected. Evelyn Thomas's message lit up my phone. Hello, Jackson. Just to be clear, the divorce papers will be served at 10 o'clock this morning. I've also advised Lucas to have as good a day as possible. All things considered, go to the shop before going for work. I double-checked the house security system. It was still recording, and I had configured it to alarm my phone if anything happened. I had a noon meeting with the architect to finalize some revisions for a client, so I worked on tiny jobs until then. I half expected Caroline to call after she was served with the divorce papers, but my phone remained silent at 11.40. I messaged Lucas, expressing my surprise at her silence. This suggests she's probably already discussed the documents with Nelson. They could be planning their next move. I'll follow up with Grace. Stay tuned. He texted back. The appointment with the architect turned out to be more useful than I expected, allowing me to remain grounded among the swirling craziness of my personal life. After that, I spent the afternoon maintaining my tools and cleaning the shop. Later, Lucas sent an alert on my phone. It's starting. He added the thumbs up emoji. I promptly entered into my home surveillance system from my store and viewed the live video. Caroline had just entered with a man I didn't recognize. They went directly to the home office and turned on my computer. The two limited their conversation to a minimum. The dude spent a few minutes to hack my password before inserting a flash drive into the computer and performing some suspicious activity for around 15 minutes. I watched closely, noting every move they did in preparation to provide this proof to Lucas and Grace. I was able to acquire clear photographs of the man's face from the CCTV tape. Meanwhile, Caroline went to the guest room to load her items into rubbish bags because her suitcases were still in the master bedroom closet. After finishing his dubious activities, the man turned off the computer, informed Caroline that he was going, and exited. She packed hurriedly and left the house shortly after. Lucas called me as soon as the recording ended. All fine, Jackson. Go home and act normal. I believe they will involve the cops tonight or maybe tomorrow, so be ready for an inspector to arrive. They will require several hours to obtain a search warrant. So that's your heads up for tomorrow. Could I actually be arrested? I inquired, my tone barely above a whisper. It is feasible, Lucas said soberly. If this happens, be quiet. Do not say anything to them. I've already spoken with Oliver Wilson, a leading criminal defense attorney. I gave him all of the recordings and details. He assured me that this should be the easiest case he's handled this year. He reassured me. I gave Lucas the code to my alarm and recording systems in case I was arrested. As I drove home after our conversation, I had a sense of uneasiness. The remainder of the evening was strangely quiet. There were no police, Caroline made no calls, and Nelson left no threatening notes. I fixed myself a sandwich and tried to relax in front of the television. I was tempted to phone my folks and fill them in, but I opted not to. Explaining all of this computer manipulation and cloud-stored films seemed like an unnecessary source of concern for my mother. It was better to wait until everything had been handled. The next day, when I was at work, my phone vibrated with an alert. There was an intruder at my home. 
Following convention, I texted Lucas right away and logged into my security system. The police had arrived and were disarming the alarm. They were able to shut down the system, taking off my vision. Lucas replied back shortly, saying he'd seen everything and had already given the film to my lawyer, Oliver Wilson. Approximately an hour and a half later, two police policemen entered my establishment. They approached me quietly but aggressively, informed me that I was under arrest, and handcuffed me. They gave me my rights as they brought me to their car and began asking questions while driving. I followed Lucas's earlier suggestion and remained silent at the station. They confiscated my phone and money and locked me in a cell with five other people. No one said much. We all simply stared at the floor tiles, engrossed in our own thoughts. After what seemed like an eternity in that cell, a guard arrived and led me to a meeting room. You'll meet your lawyer here, he explained as he led me down the corridor. Wait, I never told anyone who my lawyer was, I argued, but the guard did not react. When the door eventually opened 15 minutes later, it was not Oliver Wilson who entered. Noah Nelson wore a cocky grin. He sat across from me, first wordless, simply keeping my stare. I stared back, unwilling to give him the satisfaction of seeing me rattled. He was plainly happy with himself, believing he had the upper hand. Noah finally broke the silence and spoke. Do you comprehend the gravity of the situation? Noah's voice was full with disdain, but I remained silent. I asked you a question, Henderson. Answer me, you insignificant insect. I stayed mute. I choose not to play into his hands. It will be your word against mine, Henderson. A carpenter's word versus the city's most known lawyer. Can you guess the outcome? He kept his smug look as if he enjoyed the power imbalance. He rose up and straightened his suit as if about to leave a boardroom. All right. It appears that you need some time to consider what I've said. We'll resume our discussion tomorrow morning. Perhaps a night in this shared cell can help clear your mind. He announced, then turned on his heel and exited the room, the door clicking shut behind him. The gravity of the situation sank in deeply, but his statements did not frighten me. They instilled a developing determination to fight back. I was escorted back to the cell, which was now occupied by only four others. Later that afternoon, I was brought back to the meeting room. This time, a tall, blonde man with a serious gaze was waiting for me. He remained standing as I entered. Do not tamper with me, he began abruptly. Then his tone softened slightly. Good afternoon, Jackson. It's a pleasure to meet you. I am Oliver Wilson. You can call me Oliver. Lucas approached me earlier today. He was having problems contacting you. We suspected you'd been arrested and brought here. I took a big breath and recounted what had happened that day, including my distressing encounter with Noah Nelson. Oliver listened closely his expression changing to astonishment, but he remained silent until I finished. All right, you will appear before a court tomorrow morning. Expect the bail to be high, but don't worry. Lucas is on top of the situation, Oliver reassured me, his tone steady and authoritative. I know tonight will be difficult, but hang in there. Lucas and I are here to help you. Keep refusing to answer their inquiries. I have officially taken on your case, and be assured, Noah Nelson will not disturb you again. The next morning, I appeared before the judge facing charges of possessing illicit materials, and I pleaded not guilty. The bail was set at $1.17, which seemed almost mockingly low. I was freed later that afternoon under the condition that I not leave the city boundaries or contact my soon-to-be ex-wife or anyone from her office, but I could continue working at my store. They returned my phone and money, and Oliver took advantage of the opportunity to catch up taking me out for a late lunch. As we sat down to dine, I told Oliver that I had been cautious about what I said at the police station the previous day, concerned about who might be listening. However, after making a few calls and conducting some research, I discovered some interesting facts regarding Noah Nelson. I informed him, ready to reveal the results of my investigation. First, I continued the procedure of obtaining a search warrant. It takes several hours, only after that may they review their findings and get an arrest warrant. In my situation, they called me in before they had finished searching my home. Second, I added, shifting in my seat as the seriousness of my next statement sunk in. Despite all of my limitations on contacting you or Lucas, Nelson did not receive permission to see me. That just does not add up. Oliver nodded, his gaze narrowing intently. 
These anomalies strongly suggest that the entire scenario was staged, which is clearly illegal. It appears that they acted too quickly, which will benefit us. He reassured me, his confidence lifting my spirits as we discussed our future steps. However, Lucas said that Kramer wields a lot of power with the judges. I expressed concern about the extent of the influence. Oliver gave a knowing wink. Not with everyone, he reassured me. You can't make that many friends without making some foes along the way. I'm not even sure what I will find when I return home. I hope my wife and her scheming partner haven't cleared everything out. Don't worry about it, Oliver said firmly. Lucas arrived at your residence shortly after the police left. He reconfigured the security system and programmed it to record. Nobody has returned since. I left the restaurant feeling relieved and returned to my business to pick up my automobile. Then I drove home, ready for a shower and the comfort of familiar surroundings. On the way, I checked my messages and discovered one from the architect. The client had approved the amended plans. That was one bit of good news, at least. It meant I could resume work tomorrow, which was a pleasant distraction. And despite all that had transpired, I was determined to move forward. When I arrived home, I walked into complete commotion. The house appeared to have been battered by a hurricane. Each drawer was pulled out. Every cabinet is open. The police had flipped everything upside down to seek for proof, aside from the modified computer. I knew they would find nothing damning, but the sight of my disturbed existence made my heart sink. For the first time since the horror started, I cried. Just a week ago, I was happily married and living a calm life. I was now entangled in a criminal investigation on the verge of divorce and caught up in the schemes of my wife's boss. How did my life unravel so quickly? Fortunately, the media circus had not reached my doorstep. They were too preoccupied with a scandal involving billions in missing taxpayer funds. I was only Jackson, a little fry in a large pond, and it was great with me. A week later, Oliver called with breaking news. All charges against me have been withdrawn. Nelson's techniques had not persuaded the inspector on my case, who was well known for his anti-blackmail stance. Instead, he accused Noah Nelson of blackmail, evidence forgery, and illegal possession of child-related documents. Caroline was implicated, and two people are facing conspiracy charges, just as I was processing this. The phone rang again. As I was about to leave, Lucas approached me and invited me to supper. My divorce attorney, Evelyn Thomas, called with an update. Jackson, Caroline's lawyer, contacted me this afternoon. She's prepared to sign the divorce papers. There are no modifications, but she just wants one thing. A 1.5-hour private meeting with you, preferably at Malachy's. The prospect of meeting Caroline was the last thing I desired. But if meeting with her could speed up the divorce, it might be worth the anguish. I instructed Evelyn to set it up. I would meet with Caroline. Spending the evening with Lucas and Charlotte felt like a breath of fresh air. This is my first true break in weeks. Charlotte made some excellent coconut shrimp and rice, and for a few hours I was able to forget about my difficulties. When I came home, I discovered that the appointment with Caroline was scheduled for the following Wednesday. Even though I was the victim in her and Nelson's scam, the prospect of confronting her again made me uneasy. On the day of the meeting, I strolled into Evelyn's office, filled with both dread and determination. Evelyn received me at the door with a concerned expression. Jackson, I'm not sure what she's plotting, but be careful. Her own charges are significant. Do not give her anything that could be distorted and used against you in court. Remember, we can't check her for recording devices, so assume she's recording this talk. Okay, thanks for the heads up, I said, ready myself for whatever Caroline had planned. I entered a small private meeting room where Caroline was already seated. I braced myself expecting to face the same cold and calculating Caroline I'd met in recent weeks. Instead, I found her delicate, nearly shattered, despite a fleeting desire to feel sympathy in the recollection of her intimate farewell to Nelson before their secret trip, which prevented any warmth from taking root. Thank you for agreeing to meet. I began off more formal than I expected. What could you possibly be saying to me, Caroline, after everything? Tears began spilling down her cheeks. Jackson, I am deeply ashamed of how I have treated you. You were always a nice husband, and you deserved none of this. I became trapped in Noah's web and didn't realize it until it was too late. I was astonished to learn that the accusations against you had been dismissed, but Noah and I could still face prosecution. 
Return to reality. I can't even look at myself for the next 45 minutes. She poured out her thoughts, evaluating her acts and their consequences, without prodding me for information or asking questions. It was as if she needed to express her remorse and perplexity in order to understand her own dissent. Caroline's voice sounded calm and resigned. I understand that it is over between us, Jackson. If I were in your circumstances, I would also want a divorce. I do not blame you for wanting to stop things. I have quit from my work, and I informed Noah Nelson that I never wanted to speak with him again. I've returned to live with my folks and told them everything. They are furious. Let's just say it's not exactly a warm and welcoming environment right now. I simply gazed at her. There were no smart words to share. She had constructed her own tangled web, and now she was trapped inside it. She went on to say that the coming months and possibly years will be difficult for her. I'm not even sure what to expect from life anymore. She halted, her gaze fixed on me. My only hope is that after everything settles down, we can find a way to remain friends. Caroline, that is a faraway prospect. Extremely far. We will see when we get there. Good luck. I stood up, voice firm, and exited the room. Despite everything, a part of me still cared about her but I understood that reconciliation was unattainable. Initially, I felt a strong urge for vengeance, but life had already dealt her a severe reality check. She was learning her lesson the hard way, which was punishment enough. Caroline was able to reach a plea bargain by completely cooperating with the authorities against Noah Nelson. After that, she went to another city. I lost contact with her after that. When Nelson's accusations made headlines, more victims came forward with similar claims of blackmail, adding to the case against him. Nelson received an 11-year jail sentence. The police did not need me to testify because they had recorded all of my interactions with him. With Nelson's convictions secured, I filed a civil claim against him and his failing legal company. The case settled for dollar one. Five million a large portion of which I gladly gave to Lucas for his unflinching support throughout the experience. My firm has grown since then, and I'm currently in the process of acquiring a specialist door manufacturing company, which will bring six new people to what seems like my second family. Lucas and Charlotte hosted a cookout to commemorate my final divorce decree. It was then that I met Charlotte's younger sister, Olivia. We clicked right away and have been seeing each other for a few weeks now, just exploring where life might take us. A while after the settlement, I decided to pay Nelson a visit in prison, primarily out of curiosity. I requested the guard to make sure he stayed during the conversation. Nelson strutted into the visiting room, smirking confidently. What do you want from wussy? He taunted Nelson immediately away as he attempted to storm out of the room. The guard blocked his path, disregarding his insults and forced him to remain and listen. I leaned back nonchalantly and smirked at him. Oh, this is fascinating. I heard that your wife, Ava, filed for divorce. Perhaps I should take her out to dinner. Give her a night to remember. Nelson's expression twisted with wrath. You bastard, if you dare. I cut him off, grinning even wider. Save your breath. I had previously seen her. She has a dove tattoo on the top of her right leg. Really cute, isn't it? He went bright red, his fists clenched. He appeared to be about to explode with threats, but he stopped himself, possibly understanding it wouldn't help him. Look, I didn't come here to discuss Ava, I continued, my tone changing slightly. I've come to remind you of something. You truly are an idiot who requires reminders of his own folly, threatening a man within his own home, laying out the repercussions if he does not comply with your ridiculous requests. Not very bright. Even a simpleton could see through that. I broke out laughing, watching him simmer in his powerlessness and rage. Remember how you claimed that holding certain items was prohibited for a simple guy like me, but totally permissible for a big shot like you? Really? Your sense of power fascinates me. Is it really that overwhelming? And the jumpsuit, it fits you perfectly. Nelson stood there, fuming and powerless, as the reality of his new life in prison clothes set in with each word. Nelson was visibly incensed. His face was a mask of rage, as if he was about to snap. Right before I turned to leave, I pulled a folded piece of paper from my pocket and slid it across the table to him. I have something that both Ava and Caroline think you should see. It might be informative. I spoke in a calm and measured tone. 
He grabbed the paper, unfolded it with trembling hands, and stared at it for a few ten seconds. His confusion turned into frustration. What the hell is this? he demanded, staring up at me with fiery eyes. I couldn't help laughing. The sound echoed slightly in the stark room. This, I explained, pointing to the drawing, that it is a basic diagram of female V. I tapped a specific area of the paper. They wanted you to finally figure out where the arousal point is. His expression of confusion and humiliation was almost too perfect. As he processed the information, his rage appeared to boil over. Nonetheless, the absurdity of the lesson rendered him speechless. I stood up, still chuckling. Nelson, I thought you'd appreciate a little education. Take care, I advised, leaving him with his outrage and the diagram as a stark reminder of his failings.